So welcome to Partner Up Partnerships Podcast. All right, we're live. I'm excited to jump in. Let's get to work. <laughs> thing that matters in a partnership is the trust and sacrifice. Posing, building software that works for you. So that's, so that's probably how we're going to start it off today, same way. Um, yeah. You know, speaking of... Um, we were kind of talking in the pre pre roll stuff with uh, our illustrious guest today, Mr. Uh, Chris Jenkins of Workfront. Um, before we hop into Chris, Justin, uh, what was that article you slacked me this morning? Uh, this is a big partnership of ours. Holy cow! There's a lot of unicorns on the loose. We got six cents with two point one billion dollar valuation. Wow, two point one billion dollar valuation from a, 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 I mean, a company that was relatively unknown. I would even say two three years ago. I mean, that's got to solidify ABM as a category, right? I mean, is that is that when you call it? Is that when you call it, you know, defined category and something that's going to stick around for a while? I mean, I think they're calling it RevTech or something. Um, but the point is, is that there's crazy demand for ABM. Right. Crazy demand. Um, right. Given that uh, multiple on that valuation. So shout out to the Sixth Sense crew, um, Elliot, Viral, um, Jason, Lotney, Mark, uh, all the folks over there, uh, kudos on a fantastic raise and a huge milestone. So yeah. um, they're definitely part of the uh, MarTech B2B kind of like partner ecosystem that's uh, coming into the, the forefront. Um, but uh, passing the partner news, um, I want to give a shout out on the pre-roll too before we uh, pop over to Chris, because I haven't done any pre-roll kind of shout outs of the Cloud Software Association lately. There we go. I'm normally mentioning them at the end. Um, so if you really like what we're talking about on the pod and uh, want to engage with folks like Chris and um, other thought leaders in the partnership space, there is a community. So it's at the Cloud Software Association. About 4,000 partner professionals are in there. So um, follow along, come join in. There's no cost to join, or you can be an executive member for 250 bucks a year. Um, so I am, and uh, there is my plug for the CSA. So can I with, add to that? I, I've, but, I've, been in the, I've been in the Slack group, and you know I, I've watched some of the threads, but. I got to say the probably the best part is Wednesday or Thursday getting, you know, an all at here notification about their upcoming webinars and on typically Thursdays there's just been some really good ones lately, really good advice that just popped up right, kind of right when I needed it. Um so if you're looking for ongoing ed, ongoing networking, you know, ways to sharpen your game, I think at least be a part of the Slack group, have it open so you get those notifications take a look at the topic. It may or may not resonate with you, but uh, lately they've been on fire. So just want to throw in that little personal plug there. Love it. Love it. Well, Chris, you've uh, heard Justin and I banter enough. Welcome to Partner Up, my man. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate you guys having me today. I'm excited. I've heard a few of your podcasts and uh, it's, yeah, I'm excited. I'm, I'm thrilled that you even thought of me to bring me to the, to the plot podcast. Fan. So I mean, yeah. we need swag. We need swag. This is why we need swag at this point in time. Swag? Oh, we did some partner <laughs> swag? It's about time, yeah. It's partner a pretty swag. common thing to do with uh, partners, right? Is to share the swag. Uh, yeah, gotta, yeah. Um, that just, we gotta do I'm not going to let my brain entertain that idea, <laughs> Justin. I, don't, don't send me down the swag rabbit hole for partner up. I do not. Yeah. Uh, He's already thinking about the socks and pencils and yeah. the glasses. Justin's going to get slacks for me at 3 a.m. tonight. Yeah. It's like, what do you think <laughs> of this? Yeah. What do you think I just ordered this swag. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh gosh! Uh, I, have a, funny, I have a funny story off that, but uh, for a later date, we'll get to it. Yeah, for for a later date, that's when we had a uh, Marnie Reed of PFL. That's we'll have to get her take on that because she knows swag. Um, well, today with Chris, um, kind of what we wanted to to hop into was thinking about nailing that strategic alliance so well that they want to buy you. And now you can't do this with every single partner, right? There's kind of like this other class of partnership that that lives above the rest that. Um, I think really has uh, ELT or executive team, you know, um, buy-in alignment and even visibility, right? Like the C-suite is thinking about it. It's so big. The C-suite can't think about all your partners, but they really can think about that top tier one percentage. And why have you, Chris? Well, uh, speaking of unicorns and, you know, billion and multi-billion dollar exits, um, you most recently built and scaled a partnership with Adobe at Workfront, which is now a uh, part of the Adobe family. Um, so maybe we could start there as a general topic is like, yeah. you know, what was the charter whenever you came in to um, into Workfront around partnerships and alliances and what led you to making a particular bet uh, on Adobe? Yeah, awesome. So 
a little bit of my background. Um, I've been in, in software engineering product management for most of my career. So I've been like really close to the technical side of, of software uh, companies and software building. Um, and prior to joining Workfront, I was with a small startup called Banyan and we sold to a local company here in Utah called Nuvi. Um, and, uh, you know, made a little exit and, um, and, and I was kind of looking for what that next thing was. And I had never really considered technology partnerships or even, even partnerships in general as a, as a potential career path, but, uh, the, whatever the listing was for this job, I don't, I, I can't remember all the details, but I thought this actually could be really interesting because as I was leading the product and engineering group at Mannion. Um, I spent a lot of time with technology partners and ultimately that's how this uh, acquisition with Nuvi happened um, was just through those relationships and, and starting to build like, where do we best fit uh, for customers? Right. And so uh, I interviewed with Paige Erickson. She brought me in and, uh, and what was great was that they had already started a uh, kind of a technology partner part of their business, a program. And this role was uh, to lead strategic technology partnerships. Uh, they had a couple contacts at Adobe. They had uh, built some integrations at Workfront with Adobe and had been thinking about, you know, that, that this could be a, a good opportunity just because a lot of our customers overlapped, right? And so what I was told basically those first few weeks at Workfront was it's important for us that you make sure that Workfront becomes relevant inside of Adobe. And, uh, and that was ultimately the charter. There wasn't a whole lot uh, more detail to it other than figure out what that means. Uh, talk, tell us what the budget looks like. Where do we need to invest? Who do we need to be talking to? What, in, what, um, in, you know, what engagements do we need to make? Um, integrations, et cetera, to, uh, to make something happen. And what was great was, you know, they thought about it more holistically than just a, a single partner. Um, it was very much, Hey, Adobe is one that we see a lot of traction, but like the spectrum of partnerships is open. So wherever you can find traction, uh, please go do that. Get as much traction as you can in those in those partnerships. Uh, and so that's really how it started was just, you know, we believed at the top level. So I think, Jared, to, to your point in the beginning, um, Paige uh, actually had the full buy in from the executive leadership team. So she sat on the executive leadership team, reported to the CEO. And because she had that like direct connection, you know, to the CEO from a partnership standpoint, I think that really lent itself to getting the right support from the rest of the organization, because it's such a challenge, as I'm sure all these listeners, um, your audience um, understands is like, it's hard to get professional services, it's hard to get sales, it's hard to get engineering, it's like, there's so many departments and, and teams that you have to work with, and to get them to understand and, and be able to prioritize partners can be a very, very challenging thing. And so that's that's ultimately where it started. We had the right buy-in at the executive level, the right charter to just become relevant in the right sort of big brother type technology companies, and then you know figure out along the way who the right people are, the right partners to give you the, the right traction. And that's what, that's what started to happen at Adobe and ultimately led to the acquisition. And I can talk in more detail about those things, but um, I think the last thing I would say as part of the introduction is, um, Every one of those companies that we looked at as a strategic technology partner uh, was significantly bigger than us. Like we knew that they could write a $2 billion check or a $10 billion check, whatever it was that we felt like we needed, right, to exit. Um, although we were not targeting that, it was never mentioned to me that uh, we wanted to exit that way. Um, we always wanted to IPO and, and move the company in that direction. Um, it just, what it did was it gave us options, you know, so that when the time did come to make some decisions, we had those options and we were in a good place financially to make it, um, you know, to make it where, wherever we wanted to go. I, I have a, this is a silly tactical question. Follow up from that, given mm -hmm. the, the awesome intro you had, because I've been involved in one of these before where I was a part of that M and a conversation. Like I was coordinating meetings. Like it was, it was something that was brought up kind of by me, um, with a, a public, you know, leading kind of a platform, um, marketing and sales platform. The, the question that I have is at what point did you know that conversation was turning that direction? And was that something that was a part of what you were doing? Cause like throughout the entire life cycle, it's like, we're not selling, we're not selling it, not selling. And at some point that changes to like, 
oh, there's actually an M and A evaluation that's happening. I'm curious when you knew that was happening and if you were involved in that process. Yeah. So without getting into too much detail, of course. Um, basically, what I was trying to do was set up as many of those companies that could have that conversation as possible, right? And so every conversation that I was having with with, it, with executives generally. Um, I knew that that was always an undercurrent, right? Right. That they're exactly. always it's never discussed, about. but it's no, no, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not something that's brought up initially. Right. And, and, and really holding your cards, right. You're playing a poker game. So you're just like holding your cards as close to your chest as possible. Um, and, and not revealing them until it's, until it's the right moment. And so I think in, in this case, right. All of those executive conversations, it was, it was pretty clear that, um, you know, it was an undercurrent and that we would have the opportunity at some point in the near future to have that conversation about, you know, whether they're interested in wanting to do that or not. Um, how it happened, you know, with Adobe, uh, I can't share the details, but certainly, um, you know, I'm when just it curious got if, to that if place. It was on your radar, right? Like whenever oh, yeah. it was like it wasn't and then it was. And then in terms of the um, due diligence, let's call it that, if you were helping facilitate due diligence. Yeah, so so all of that got um, kind of started with me and then transitioned to uh, the rest of the team. So so gotcha. essentially our executive team, we're a pretty small team, right? Like there's less than 15, you know, executives at Workfront. And and so that group and the engineering team and sort of the need to know uh, group is where that, you know, where those conversations were had. And so my role at that point basically just became continue to sell in the field, continue to get traction, continue to show value um, versus being, you know, directly in the conversation for right. the, uh, the due diligence. Gotcha. Okay. Um, okay. All of the, all of the materials, all of the demos, all of the conversations that they were having were all related to the work that had been done by me and my team. And then when that was all uh, taken care of, then clearly in the due diligence as they looked at like the value proposition, the customer joint customers that we had, the, the future opportunity, all of that stuff had been completed as part of the partnership process. Right. Yep. Gotcha. So going back to the beginning, you're given this charter of be known and that, yeah. that sounds, sounds kind of vague, right? It can mean quite a few different things. How did you translate that into like your own initial goals with the partnership and what you set out to do in kind of phase one of the partnership? Yeah, so great question. Because for me, not having done partnerships in the past, like I was sort of clueless on what that meant, you know, and 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 what was important. So like the first month or so of of being in this role and kind of learning the details of Workfront and, and how it mattered to the Adobe customer and, and things like that. Um, I didn't, you know, I was very much focused on the integrations and very much focused on like, how do you support the customer and add drive value to the customer? And, and that was certainly an important aspect because, because I think my ability to understand all the technical details of, and the value of, of the solution together makes help, I think makes me better in the conversations with the right folks, but I was neglecting just the, the number of conversations that you have to have, uh, with salespeople with with leaders executives with um you know partner managers with like there's so many folks inside of large organizations like that that you need to have a rapport with you need to have understand who you, you need to name drop like there's so many things that i i just really didn't understand and so i i had some great coaching from uh brent nixon uh at uh at workfront and paige erickson both both uh, on my team uh page who i reported to um it just really helped me start to see like what's what's important is less the integration itself certainly you know having the right integration of value proposition is important because you can't go anywhere without that but once you have that it's really about the number of conversations that you can have with the right people and so you could you could kind of say you know you pick up the phone talk to the right person or you send the, the linkedin message and you start to have those conversations and then you start checking the box of whether that was the right conversation or the wrong conversation. And if it's a right conversation, then you move them to the next level of, okay, so this person now gets it. Who can they introduce me to right at that next level? And so you just start climbing that ladder of, you know, do they get it or do they not? And are they willing to bring us forward or not? And then you just have to move through that and navigate through that as quickly as possible uh, so you can get to the right people. Once you have the right people at uh, at the organization, then it gets really easy, right? Because then you start to get sort of a champion that can start driving you to the right conversations. And they know all of like, 
uh, and this is something that they don't just share with whoever that you know with anybody but like where when are they having you know sales qbrs when are they having um, executive meetings when are they talking about these things you know who who are the folks that are sort of leading that uh, sales uh, architecture sales engineering like that's that's really where you start to get the value is you get those right people into and then they bring you into the right meetings where you can then ex, you know sort of extend that value proposition much further in that organization so whenever you're you're i like the simple way that you framed it like the right people, the right conversation. In terms of like frameworks, I think a lot of partnerships professionals need even the most basic framework to think about, you know, working a large account. I'm curious how you thought about that simple framework of right person, right conversation in the context of like, let's say goal setting or planning, right? So in the beginning, I'm sure the the, the goals with a, an alliance partner are very, you know, to Justin's point, vague, but he says vague, that's your Minnesota showing, Justin, I gotta give you, I gotta push out on that one. Um, uh, it's a low he's, blow. Gonna, he's gonna order a bagel, a bagel next. Yeah. A bagel. Uh, you, you owe me a zinger, Justin. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the question I was gonna get to was, how do you think about that from a whenever you move out of that vagueness and into okay here's what we're trying to drive with our strategic alliance partner like i think that framework's helpful but the totality of those meetings like you probably need executive alignment in product in marketing in sales in field in product marketing right um how did you start to think about those two things colliding of like okay here's how we're going to drive x millions of dollars and here's why we need to have this partnership across the organization. Did those two things yeah. ever collide for you? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, um, and I'll, I'll share a little bit of, of sort of the sausage making, I guess, of, of what we did here. Um, the first thing was, and I don't know where this came from cause I didn't, uh, it's, it's not something that I invented, but, um, I was basically told that the, the thing you have to think about is, is what we call the high value network. And, and I, it wasn't explained in great detail to me other than, Hey, you need to build a high value network. And I was like, okay, what does this mean? And so I did some research and tried to you know, figure out what it was, but for me and for our team, what that meant was, is, uh, we had to start mapping who the right people we thought, at least who we thought the right people were inside of the organization in kind of an org chart fashion. Right. So, you, and then we broke it up into the different departments. So we thought about you know, sales engineering is one department and who were those right people, right? And you can do a little bit of that in LinkedIn through Sales Navigator and, and other areas, um, but you can start to identify that. Now, then you, um, and you can do all of this in like a Lucid chart or something. And then you have, uh, the way we did it was like a couple of check boxes where you could say, okay, that is the right person or no, it's not the right person, right? And then you start to switch in and out the right people uh, once you've been able to find somebody who can really help you identify, you know, identify that inside of the company. So that's what we were able to do initially was um, we understood sort of vaguely who we need, uh, you know, who we need to contact in the different groups. So sales, engineering, sales, product, product marketing, et cetera. Um, and then who were the key, our key champions in all of those areas and then who they ne needed to then introduce us to so that we could get up to those, to those next levels. Right. And it wasn't easy because uh, th there's a lot of gatekeepers when you're trying to get up higher into the organizations. Right. So that was the first thing we did is we, we built this sort of high value network that, um, where the number of conversations that we had would ultimately in our minds lead to the right conversations. Uh, at uh, at these partners, right? And then the next thing to do is once you've had those conversations, and, and I say this because every call that we had, we made it a point to ask, who else should we be talking to? Who are the accounts that we should be talking to? Um, and um, who who else can you introduce us to? And so when we when we were asking those questions, we would usually get one or two referrals. Um, from in time, in, inside of the company, not necessarily sales referrals, but uh, sometimes they were, and, and, and then we would ask them to actually make those introductions. And they generally would. Um, we would get uh, a quick email and then we would set up a call, right? And so once you start doing that, you, then you start to really add that, add that value. Once you get to that right person, then you have the account conversations. And that's where, Jared, to your point about like, how are we then gonna drive the value? Because you, once you have that, then you can start to say, okay, this looks like a five, $10 million opportunity. 
uh, as we, if, you know, if we were to promote this through our normal channels, then, um, and then you can take that back to your organization, right? And so you can say, hey, it, with product, if we do this, right, you name whatever the integration need is or the, or the important piece, then we can execute on the five to $10 million or whatever the number is. Right. And, and it's a, it's just a fight for resources and priorities. Um, so, but it really started with building the high value network, having those right conversations with the right people, and then taking that, that data back to your organization so that they know that you're building this network that's going to drive um, revenue for your business. And once, once they start to see that, then they get the buy-in. And once that buy-in is there, you know, then uh, then the doors start to open up. I'll say that with Adobe specifically, um, we that was a huge challenge, like all of 2019, right? It was just like, let's get all of the right people, build the right network, get, get the right conversations, understand what that value is. And then in 2020, like the very end, beginning of end of 19, beginning of 2020, we finally got the full executive team's buy-in to say, we are going to invest more in this relationship. And so when that happened, that's where it started to take off. Now we knew that if I, my team were to call up sales or marketing or any organization inside of Workfront, they had to listen because it was a, it was a key initiative for the whole company and uh, they would put budget towards it. Like we, it was a, it was a surprise to me how much more support we got once it became a strategic initiative for the company. How was that communicated to the company? So Alex, our CEO, is a fantastic communicator, and uh, and we as a company have a, a product where we actually call it goals, and it's like an OKR system, right? And so we truly believe in in cascading goals and thinking through the value of of uh, OKRs. And so literally, we as an executive and operational leadership team sat down and decided on what those four initiatives were going to be across the company, and then uh, and then once once all of that was decided, then we cascaded all of that to our teams. So that was very, that became very clear. So was at it our one sales, of the four? It, so it was of the four, each had like two or three that uh, were a part of uh, those four that gotcha. uh, every group had. And, and one of those was um, this accelerate, accelerate with Adobe. And, uh, and then that's what got, you know, all of the support from the rest of the company. So in the beginning, you talked in terms of, um, before we kind of hopped on, Chris, we were talking about the context in a lot of your story at Workfront is about Adobe proper, but this could be translated to any other person where, you know, strategic partnerships are kind of like their charter. Talk to me a little bit about what percentage of time you were focused on Adobe proper, right? Like you've, you've made a bet, uh, Workfront as a company, and then you and your position of making this bet on Adobe. How much time were you spending on Adobe at the beginning versus how much time were you spending you know, kind of later on um, in helping kind of build and uh, passing off Legos to uh, steal a, a Molly Graham term. Yeah, so we, I, I spent most of my time initially on Adobe. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, probably 70 to 90% of my time was, was on Adobe initially, uh, just having, trying to have the right conversations. Once, once it started to gain traction, it was too much for just one person to handle. And it was, it got very much, um, it required that we hired somebody. So we actually brought on a former Adobe PSM or partner sales manager that had worked, been working for another partner uh, to really come lead that sort of in the field day-to-day -day work. And he spent his entire time, like 99% of his time was on Adobe. And then I still spent another 40% of my time on Adobe, if not more. Um, it, it then began where I, because I then had time to start developing more of these other relationships, that's where we started to get some uh, options, right? Once you start to see that, hey, there's some traction with one, how much more traction can we get with these other, what we call, you know, big brother partnerships? Um, and that was part of the remit from Paige and Alex was uh, they, they had us read this book called Blueprint to a Billion. And uh, in chapter five, it very much talks about these uh, big brother partnerships and how you accelerate into new markets through these big brother partnerships. And so I, that's what the rest of my time was spent on. But Adobe was 90% in the beginning, 70 to 90, and then hired somebody full time to do it, a senior, you know, product uh, partner manager. And then, and then I still spend another 40% of my time on it. And did you jump into the sales motion right away or did you take some time to build that high value network and kind of put the story together, the integrations, what this would look like. Were they running concurrently? What did that look like? 
Yeah, so we had an integration with Adobe, you know, years ago, and it was very much for creative teams, creative studios. And that integration is what sort of led the value proposition, right? It was very much directing from a customer standpoint what what needed to happen in this space. And so it, because the story sort of developed itself, right, and, and, and the customer really pointed us to where it needed to go, there were already a lot of sales happening before we started building that high value network. So what was nice about it was the, the building blocks were there. We just needed to then expand the network of those that really understood the value of that uh, of that uh, combination of Workfront and Adobe. So um, yeah, definitely after we built the high value network is when it accelerated, but we didn't need to wait too much on, you know, on building a story, building a, a customer following. Those things um, had already started to build themselves from, uh, from customers. Right. And was there like one event, we found this with a lot of the partnership professionals we've had when they're talking about specific partnerships, there's something that is a turning point where it really clicks for everybody as far as the potential, the size, the you know value that's being created with the partnership. Was there like an event or a moment or a customer story where it really clicked and everything started to, you know, to 10 X from there? Yeah, I think we had a couple uh, customer stories that were just really good brands. And when you have those, the right brands and then they, you have their buy-in to promote their brand in that same story, uh, that's re really where it started to take off. Um, for Adobe, what's and there are a lot of partners right now at Adobe in this same space where um, we were in their exchange program. And as an exchange partner, you know, we were at kind of a mid-tier uh, partner. We decided to invest in the top tier level. And when we did that, right, we were able to get more marketing support. We were able to get the sales team's uh, interest uh, because there was some quota retirement if they brought Workfront into deals. Uh, there was a lot of reason why um, prior to that, the sales reps didn't necessarily want to talk to us. Um, they, you know, as much as we wanted to show that like this is a huge high value for you and your customers, if there's no real incentive for the rep, then it can be a hard conversation, right? And so that was where I think I, I would say that part of that turning point was moving into that next tier and getting that support where it was actually retiring quota for reps. Uh, they were starting to see value into why they would want to bring us into conversations because ultimately then we were able to join a lot more QBRs. We were able to, to hawk our wares better than we've ever been able to. Um, but uh, yeah, that was a good investment on the, on the workfront side. As you, um, how has your role started to, uh, how to start to change, you know, after the acquisition and you're looking at kind of like, okay, here's now the other side of the table, right? So you were, you were big brother partnership focused. Now you're big brother. I mean, you work at the second largest software company in the world, right? How, how yeah. do you think your role starts to change and your perception of partnerships, maybe some of the lessons that you've learned looking at it from the other side of the table? Yeah. Um, great question. Um, there's a lot going on right now, right? I mean, through the acquisition, we're still sort of ironing out where everybody fits, uh, how these organizations sit together, um, what that might look like. Um, it is nice to be on this side, right? And be able to tell technology companies like you need to conform to our needs versus <laughs> the other way around, right? Which is sort of what we did. That we were good more the, the first community. time you were able to say that? <laughs> it felt very good, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we had some conversations where I thought, yeah, this is actually, we're finally making progress. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with me. It was just the big A, right? That was uh, all that mattered. No, but uh, the, the fun part too is that uh, no matter who we want to have a conversation with, we can now. Um, and we usually can get to the right person very quickly, uh, which is also really great. So from from that perspective, I think that there's a lot of, great opportunity for work fronts uh, inside of Adobe now that um, I, you know, I had already seen and, and had been trying to promote for a long time, but now that Adobe sees it, they are, you know, taking work front into a lot of different places. Um, the other thing that I would say too, Jared, to that question is, um, you know, work fronts as a, as a software acquisition that Adobe made 
right, was looking at this as a growth opportunity. It was very much, it's not like they came in just to acquire customers or to acquire a technology, right? They, they acquired the whole company looking at it as a huge long-term play in a space that's cr continually growing in the collaborative work management space, right? And we're, you know, looking at it from initially, like, let's just nail marketing as a solution. But overall, there's there's a lot of opportunity for work management more broadly across all companies in, in lots of different departments. And so I see that the resources that Adobe has to come in and really sort of expand that to where Workfront just by themselves just wasn't able to get to that full fruition of the long-term vision can actually be executed. And, and I think that's part of why, you know, it's, it's a little bit speculation, but like part of why our um, executive team was, was happy with that acquisition was Adobe is one of the few companies out there that can really take the vision that we had and execute on it. Going into um, kind of the relationship, and we've talked kind of a little bit about the beginning and, and kind of the end. Can you pinpoint a turning point? Um, I, I, this is where I, I I like to reference maybe some tangential material. Um, so Chris Voss uh, never split the difference, and what he talks mm -hmm. about black swan events, right? So these black swan events I've found are key to unlocking strategic alliances. It's like this thing that is true. But the people sitting across from the table for me don't realize is true and that I don't realize is true until it becomes true. Was there one of those black swan events during your tenure where you were like, whenever we realize this, that's when things changed? Yeah, I think that uh, the first thing was, and Workfront was just really good at this from the beginning, was that we are so much smaller than these partners. And so we, we can't go in there with a chip on our shoulder about who we are, what we do, uh, expectations, right? I mean, I think a lot of startups and, and technology companies very much feel like their technology is better than anybody's out there, or they're disrupting the market, or they're doing things that nobody else has ever done. And they, they have we that have sort AI, of... We have AI, and yeah, that exactly. means that we're special. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> you know, I think that we were... We were sufficiently um, self-aware enough to know that, you know, whenever we were in the conversation with Adobe, we were the little brother. We were we were definitely there to learn and to grow, but not, and not really push beyond what we can push in that in that conversation. I think that really helped us uh, because then then folks inside of Adobe that saw that that um, we had something, um, but we weren't we weren't going to mess up relationships that they had or you know, um, that they could feel comfortable taking us to their boss or taking us to the executives. That's when, that's when it started to really take off was, you know, they, they really knew that they could take us, um, to a lot of places because we knew that we, we weren't bigger than we were. Right. And, and we weren't trying to change anything that they were doing. We wanted to conform as much as we can to what they do, because we knew that's where the opportunity was. Um, maybe um, last, oh, maybe, maybe I, a, a way to tweak that would be was there a moment where you realized or it was realized jointly, like what's in it for me? So I have my A red hat on. I could put on my mm -hmm. Adobe red hat, actually. Um, I have that on. And, and then there was some point, Chris, where your team and their team were like, here's what's in it for Adobe. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, getting to that right person. Um, when you have the right person that can see that value that's that's there, Meaning a, a couple of examples would be like, um, we have a technology or, or a business unit that's driving $100 million in revenue, right? If I were to add another SKU to that, how much more revenue is that? Did I double? Did I triple? Did I, is it half? Like, what does that look like? And when you get the right person to see that, and then they can take it to the right person, all of a sudden there's a lot of momentum behind it and a lot of people investing in it because they know that, that they can hinge their career a little bit on that opportunity. So you just have to provide, you know, whatever that opportunity is to the right person and help them see that one thing. And usually it's revenue driven. I mean, I, from, from the workfront side, it definitely was revenue driven. It was, we, we were very much focused on how can we take, you know, little old workfront, attach it to a SKU, attach it to a go to market or a specific sales play that we know could drive uh, X number of deals more or increase the average sales value uh, by a certain amount in those uh, in those accounts, and then and then from there, like it became very clear when when Adobe looked at Workfront as an acquisition, like yeah, this is this is going to drive you know a lot of conversations that we wouldn't otherwise have had, and then there's obviously growth beyond that.
So th- I think that would be the one thing. I don't know if that answers your question, but I feel the, like no, that's, you that's actually answered that. my question incorrectly twice. <laughs> but here's what I mean by that. <laughs> yeah, Jared, be nice. you answered uh, you answered in a way I didn't expect, <laughs> which doesn't mean it's actually incorrect. I'm just messing with you. You you answered yeah. in two ways I didn't expect because I think most people have a tendency to answer that question from like a product positioning perspective, right? Like we're bringing new capabilities to market together, right? <laughs> They try to go like, hey, here's what's missing. And then here's why that makes your company more defensible or attractive to current or future customers, right? Like that's how Mm -hmm. I probably would have answered the question, which means uh, I probably would have answered it incorrectly because I actually like your answers a lot more than what I would have given (laughs) is that, um, you know, it's about money. It's about money. So how do you help them make more money in the most simplest terms? And then behind that, I'm assuming, right, the third way would be like, yeah, here's actually how Workfront um, delivered a capability that Adobe didn't have, right? Well, like I was saying earlier, you know, the customer was already telling us exactly where this needed to go. Like you, I could list, you know, Fortune, Fortune 100 companies, multiples that were doing Workfront and Adobe together. So it wasn't like a, a, a stretch to say that there's right. value here across these product lines, right? What we had to do was just show this, like, yeah, here's, here is that, you know, added value, added value. And then, but what does that look like from a revenue standpoint? What does that look like for my team? I mean, you could literally go into like a regional sales leader and say, okay, I have, because I've worked with the PSM, we've mapped accounts. We know that there's another $10 million just in your accounts. If you can bring this product, if, you know, if we can map and talk to these accounts this way, right. And about that value, like that's, um, we, we already knew that because the customers were just screaming it, that this is a, you know, a joint uh, value that needs to happen. And part of that was, and I guess to, to just dig just a little bit deeper in, into the kind of the direction you were thinking, the, um, we identified really early on, uh, where, where the gap was in the Adobe technology, because right. we had the right conversations with some of the solutions engineers that were saying, what we hear from our customers is that although you have workflow, it's not people in process workflow. And so we're not realizing the full value of your technology. You have great technology, Adobe, but what you don't have is we're not able to align our people and process across all of those technologies together. And so that's where we were able to go in and say with some very key words that the Adobe reps were like very used to hearing hey, we're not re- willing to renew because we didn't get the full value or our people are not aligned to the process or there's another technology that I have to sign into or I can't keep my metadata straight, something like that, right? And uh, and so we, we just went in and kind of really hit hard on those value propositions so that it would solve those headaches that they were already hearing. Jared, how do we always get to the golden nugget like right before we have to wrap? <laughs> like, that's, that what I, the... that's what I said before we started. I said, we're going to get to the best part of the pod in the last 10 minutes because we got to get, you know, A, we're looking to who we need to bring back on again. So uh, Chris is a repeat guest already, I can tell. Um, but uh, yes, that is, that is. Um, yeah, hell of a first story in partnerships, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that, that's one thing that I, I just can hang my hat on now, I guess, is that, uh, you know, I've done it once and that's all I need. Right. <laughs> so I, it doesn't sound like you start. want to do it again. <laughs> well, I, I would be happy to do it again. What's interesting at Adobe, right. Is like, we're already at that sort of top, you know, top right. echelon of, of com- companies, but like, where can that go from here? And I think that there's a lot of things that Adobe's thinking about that uh, maybe other companies just aren't thinking in the same light and Workfront Certainly we think about the world a little differently than others do in the same space. And I, and I think that will add to it. Um, one, one follow on from that last point, I, I'm assuming that's where the enablement collateral, the joint value propositions, like the, the Adobe plus Workfront story started to develop. And that's what ended up in front of solutions engineers, account managers, uh, AEs, specialists. Like that's where that content ended up living at the end of the day was like, hey, here's how to help XYZ you know, account uh, or ha- how to drive that conversation. Yeah, what's great about Adobe is they already had like a partner enablement portal, right? So all of their sales reps knew that they could go to this portal to access all of the materials. So if they ever heard Workfront on any account, they would go into that portal, be sort of refreshed on what Workfront is because we're a partner and then have contact information directly to me and my team so that they could say, hey, I'm on this account. 
uh, can you connect me to the, to the rep who already has, we already know Workfront's in there or something like that, right? And that collateral was just used very widely. Um, and that, that became things like, you know, one pagers, uh, battle cards, uh, demo videos, um, uh, links to uh, different website pages, right? Or, or um, microsites that really just gave all that extra information. If you don't have all of those components, you're not going to be successful. Like I, I think that um, there's too many, too many people at the large companies, your big brother companies that uh, are already following like a very rigid sort of standard process of these are the materials. This is what you have to provide in order for us to be enabled to have a right conversation. If you don't have that, then you're already behind. Right. I, I love that. Um, you've brought a lot to the conversation from uh, kind of like the right person, right conversation checkbox and, uh, you know, org chart matrix to, um, you know, the, the brother, big brother, little brother, parent, child of kind of relationship and partnerships. In some ways, it kind of feels like parent, child, um, <laughs> it does. right? Like you're trying to help this organization mature in a lot of ways and grow up, um, you know, in their, in their rebellious teenage years, right? <laughs> in a yeah. lot of ways, I feel like that's where um, uh, companies like us are in their maturity curve. Um, maybe the last thing I wanted to touch base on is we've shared some of our best like tactical tips on this podcast before that I've actually heard from the community that they've implemented. Like one of them that Justin and I've discussed is like gong filters, yeah. right? For your tech partnerships. So like just to see how your sales team and customers are talking about them. Um, another one we've shared is like having a partner wins Slack channel to like surface visibility for anytime something awesome happens for internal buy-in. Um, that's just an easy way to aggregate some, you know, cool win so you can put it in that executive deck or in that qbr or in that sales training where you need some social proof is there anything chris like that that you would be like hey here's a tactical tip that we learned you know in, in enabling adobe or in enabling work front work front to better work with adobe um that you might have uh, for the listeners of like hey y'all should be trying this yeah i'm so that that's a good question. I've I've actually because uh, I came from the world of of not working with partners, right? Like never right. really doing any of this, and so a lot of those tips um, I started learning that I thought were radical. A lot some of the things you just mentioned, and I thought that would be that those are amazing, right? But they, we, I know that companies have been doing them forever. Um, one one that we learned uh, working directly with strategic technology partners in you know in their business, right? Not not directly with Workfront. I think that the one thing I would say for everybody is that you need to get executive buy-in on the partner organization, especially really early. If you don't have that, then you're probably destined to not make a lot of progress uh, in a, in, and it's gonna take a long time. So you've gotta get that executive buy-in internally. Both ways. What, so, I mean, like your CEO needs to have a direct report that is in the partner organization, right? So your VP, SVP of product or partnerships needs to be reporting directly to the CEO if possible or at least have on the executive team, you know, a representative from the partner organization or else you're not going to get the buy-in from the whole organization. That's, I think that's probably the biggest tip, um, which it's, it's a harder, it's easier said than done, but that, that's definitely one thing that's uh, critical. Uh, from a very, very tactical place, um, when you're working directly with your, let's say, partner sales manager or somebody internally at, uh, at, your, at whoever your strategic partner is, your big brother partner, um, you have to be visible all the time. So that means uh, you can create a community sort of email chain. And we did this where we would just blast all of our contacts and say, hey, here's, here's a win that we had. Right. So we're not telling internally at Workfront here is a win. I mean, we were, but we were telling Adobe here is a win. Right. And here are the details on that win and why it's a big deal. We were asking for uh, segments on their internal podcasts and or, or on their blog posts or on a lot of different things. Right. But we had to make sure that we were relevant every single day inside of Adobe and, and at as big of a level as we could. So, you know, you can't let a day go by where you don't have a conversation with that big partner. Uh, otherwise, um, you're going to become irrelevant. Right. Pretty quickly. So just just make sure that you're always having those conversations. That's that's what we did is is we made sure that we checked the box every single day that we were having a conversation with somebody at Adobe, as well as blasting out sort of the regular communications and in a lot of different departments. Because ultimately, um, this is what happened, right? When when that due diligence was going on, uh, people who maybe didn't know exactly who Workfront was, they went asking to every department and every team, who, who is Workfront? What do you know about Workfront, right? Or what do you know about that, that partner? 
And if they don't have positive things to say about you, then the chances of them actually writing a check later or, or doing an offer, right, are, are, you know, slim or at least not as, a, a, you know, not as likely as if you have a lot of positives from a lot of different areas. And so that's how we how we did it. We were very relevant in a lot of different teams. That way, when the CEO or the due diligence team was asking around, like, hey, what do you think about this, co- this company? They knew and they had uh, great feedback for it. Awesome. Awesome. I, I can't think of a better way to uh, put this to a, to a close, Chris. Um, you've given us a lot to digest. Like I'm actively thinking about my, our own partner motion right now. So Justin and I are going to be jamming on some stuff that we want to do differently um, after this conversation. Uh, before we, we bounce, a uh, quick reminder for everyone to uh, come check out the Cloud Software Association, 4,000 people, um, and uh, you know get some of the masterminds and stuff like that. Uh, Chris, we might want to um, connect you to do one of those mastermind sessions, actually. Um, because I absolutely love this conversation. Quick yeah. reminder, like we've just had two heavy hitters back to back, Justin. I mean, yeah. uh, if you didn't listen to our last one, we had Laura Padilla, the uh, global head of BD at Zoom. She is incredible. I mean, talk about just partner vision. And then Chris coming from the product and engineering side to like nailing and really figuring out some core tenets of partnerships, you know, kudos on the work front and Adobe story. That's one that um, some folks will be studying for a while, for sure. Um, so Justin, what are the folks supposed to do on Apple? If you're Six an Apple stars. podcast listener, six, six star stars. review, and then YouTube. Subscribe, comment, comment, follow. subscribe. There we yep. go. Yep. <laughs> Getting our CTAs down. <laughs> got our CTAs down. <laughs> Finally got our CTAs down. Um, all right. Well, Chris, thanks so much for uh, coming on Partner Up. We will definitely see you next time. Yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. Peace out, Partner Up. Thank you.